Ben, if you've got to fill up your car with gas this week, isn't your choice oil sands oil or OPEC oil instead of oil sands oil versus some future fuel? Ezra, I was expecting you to ask me that question. It's my central thesis. <laughs> it is your central thesis. And uh, the answer to my question is, to be honest, I really don't care what you fill up your car with tomorrow. Um, as much as I'm concerned about human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, and as much as I'm a proud Canadian, and I think you are as well, I think you're playing the, the nationalism card. And I don't think it's really sincere. Because at the end of the day, for one, bitumen needs to be blended with, with lighter fuels to even be produced. Uh, some of it comes from Calgary. A lot of it comes from elsewhere. Uh, sorry, it doesn't come from Calgary. It comes from Alberta. Uh, you know, so to, to sort of say that, you know, somehow we can really make this choice between the oil that's in Alberta and the oil that's elsewhere, I think is disingenuous. Because uh, quite frankly, we need to get off all the oil. And there's so much demand for oil worldwide. Are you really trying to tell me, and maybe I'll ask this as my next question, um, that if we continue to increase our oil, Saudi Arabia still won't sell every last drop. In fact, if we were really trying to do something about those places, would it not be a lot smarter to try to work on the, the demand side? The demand side. Uh, you know, if we took away the demand for the oil, would that not take away the market for the oil? Sure, why don't we make okay, that Okay, so what about that? Okay, and that's sort of what I was alluding to. We are the biggest energy users in the world, maybe in the top five. We have a big, cold country, we like to keep warm in the winter, we drive around, jet around sometimes, we cook our fuel with uh, power. I don't think that a billion people in China who have yet to have those, that standard of living are going to listen to you, even though you're so persuasive, Ben. I think they're going to say, sorry, we've been the subject of imperialism once before. We don't need green imperialism telling us Hey, you Westerners, I mean, Ben, I'm guessing um, that even if you drive a Pri Prius, we're, we're all using power here. I just don't think we're credible telling people in China, tut, tut, you foreigners, you don't have the same things we do. I don't think it's uh, realistic. And I, I don't even think it's ethical to tell people in China, no, you, might not, you may not drive, we're, only, we're the only ones allowed to do that. The fact that we happen to be white and you're not, ignore that too, please. Ben, I don't think that's ethical. Okay. Well, I, I, want, I want to re-ask my first question again, and I want to make it a little sharper because I can try and get you to answer it. Uh, isn't one of the themes of liberalism and environmentalism, think globally and act locally? And isn't it the case, Ben, that those 1.4 million barrels a day, sure, they're not going to put the Saudis out of business. You're right. But that's 100 million bucks a day that's going to Canadians that we spend on high wages, on hospitals and schools and peacekeepers. That's a hundred million bucks a day that's not going to the bad guys to build nuclear bombs or terrorists. Isn't that a moral improvement then? I think some of the people in the audience would prefer we didn't spend the money on some of the peacekeeping that we're doing. <laughs> Whatever else you want on, man, but it's better than what the terrorists are doing with it, no? Ezra, I, I think, once again, I think your question is somewhat disingenuous. Um, you're going to answer it anyway. Okay. Well, you're right. I, mean, I am going to answer it anyway, and I'm sure you'll keep asking it no matter what I say anyway. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the answer to your question is simple. We need to move to the real alternatives. We simply do not have a choice. And if you're asking me that question in the context of, well, what does China do? Uh, I think we have the ability to help be part of the solution, to help put solutions forward, to help develop technology, some, most of which already exists. I got driven home the other night in an electric car. 80% of the trips right now that what happened... Car was it, what kind of car was that? It was a converted Honda. How uh, much did that cost? Ezra, come on. 40000 bucks a year? I seem to remember some sort of two and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah there is. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a back and forth if you like at the bar later. Uh, <laughs> The, the answer to your question is, there is technology that exists right now. In fact, the first car that was ever made was electric. The only reason that we're stuck with this current reality is because of massive subsidies and because of a, a massive push from a big industry that's been subsidized for a century. So for you to, to stand there and say that there is no alternative, I think just completely um, you know, does a disservice to the free market values of which you assuage. I mean, uh, you know, if I was playing the role of conservative here, I would say the free market can solve any problem. And it, it seems crazy to me that you're standing here saying, we are stuck with the status quo absolutely no matter what we do. We have no choice but to be continuing to burn oil, and we're all going to face the consequences of it, like it or not, but there is no consequences, so don't worry about it. <laughs> now you can ask Ezra a question. Ezra, the, um, in the, at the Copenhagen Climate Convention, 
Uh, the African delegation walked out on more than one occasion, uh, representing the poorest people in the world. Uh, they walked out, and specifically they walked out while the Canadian delegation was speaking because they were so outraged with the role that Canada was playing. Uh, you, you know, speak at great lengths about the impacts on the Sudan and folks in Africa. Do you feel like you know better what's in the best interest of Africa than Africans? I feel I know better what's in the best of, uh, interest of Africans than, than African dictators do, than African terrorists do, than African embezzlers do. The Nigeria, uh, the Nigerian government's own commission on corruption has added up the amount of money stolen over the last 50 years by their own dictators. So this is the government itself saying, all right, we're coming clean, $366 billion stolen from their people. That works out to $18 a barrel of every barrel ever stolen, ever, ever, ever sold. And, and to me, uh, it, it, and that's just the stealing. You know, there's worse things than stealing oil money. You can use it to buy weapons, like Sudan did. And, and that's what China is doing all throughout Africa. It's basically coming in, investing in uh, zero environment, zero labor standards, zero peace, zero human rights, extracting the resources, and selling arms to these countries. That's, that's why Sudan and Iran have, have China as their protector at the UN. That's why sanctions fail against these countries, because China is not about to let its colonies be sanctioned by the UN. It's terrible. And then, it's hard for us to believe that there are places in the world that awful, where women aren't allowed to drive, where aboriginals are killed like they are in Venezuela. It's hard for us to imagine 2,000 unremediated toxic oil spills. That's Nigeria. Because we live in a country where our problems are this big, instead of a country where they're this big. 